Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation. Let's talk about innovation. At XTM International, we're very proud to sponsor this episode of this series mm -hmm. of webinars, especially as it talks about innovation. I'm Dave Ruan. Hi. There have been three previous industrial revolutions. First came steam water power, followed by electricity, then computing. Now we're in the midst of a fourth revolution, one which is driven by artificial intelligence and big data. In a recent Forbes magazine article, Bernard Marr referred to this as the intelligence revolution. Whatever we call it, whether it's Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution, or the intelligence revolution, experts tend to agree on one thing. It has the power to transform our digital world just as the three previous industrial revolutions did for our physical world. So are we ready to embrace the intelligence revolution in the localization industry and plow on through it? Well, before we meet our panel uh, and have them speak to us about how innovation is working and this <coughs> intelligence revolution's role in what they do, let me share a possible word of conscience with a short story. Over 100 years ago, as electrification swept through factories in the late 19th century, managers were looking forward to significant gains in productivity. So, you know, they thought, let's replace the steam engines and water-powered mechanical machines with modern electric motors to make our factories more efficient and yay, gains for us. Those gains didn't materialize immediately. Why? Well, in fact, it took about 40 years for them to come around until the early 1920s before the benefits of electrification impacted factory productivity. What happened? Well, they didn't really change their factories. They simply joined electric motors to the existing systems, you know, drive shafts, pulleys, belts, which were powering machines. Uh, and of course, they used it for lighting, which was a valuable resource at the time. But electric motors uh, may have been more efficient than the old power sources, but they didn't lead to massive transformation in factory economics. That transformation eventually arrived with the next generation of factories in the 1910s and 20s, when managers took advantage of the flexibility and scalability of electric drives and placing them in individual machines. The result was radical transformation of manufacturing. Factories could be organized around the flow of parts and labor without being constrained by the flow of mechanical power. Factories could be reconfigured easily as market conditions and products requirements required it. In fact, the modern factory was born. Does any of this sound a little familiar? Maybe, kind of. In our industry has the emergence of electrification, sorry, AI technologies been wholesale. Are we embracing the intelligence revolution? Well, look, let me stop talking. Let's ask our panel, shall we? So I'd like to welcome, uh, Jean Sanelar, who's CEO of Sistran, Marcus Meisel, who's a member of the management team at the Language Technology Department of SAP SE, Bob Williams, CEO at XDM International, and Marcus Casal, Senior Vice President of Global Content Technology at Amplexer International. You're very welcome to join. Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome, one and all. Well, Jean, let's start with you, shall we? You're coming from a technology a company right on the cusp of AI innovation. Are we embracing the intelligence revolution in the language industry? Um, first, I would like to say that the word artificial in AI, artificial intelligence, is by definition antinomic to the word language in language industry. Why? Because language is what defines the human. It's what's making the human. And we, I, would, I would go even further. Language is the human intelligence. How could it work then with artificial intelligence? We can accept AI as super hearing ability. We can accept that AI is superhuman for analyzing a picture, but we cannot, we don't want to accept AI to extend to language. And the simple idea of AI being used superhuman translator sounds ridiculous. When the first neural engine built for language arrived in 2015, 16, there has been some very interesting panic news where we could read that scientists had to switch off some computers because AI on this computer had started to learn together. They, they, were speak, they were speaking, talking together, 
And the process has been so far that the human could not understand anymore what they were talking about. And there was some new thing. We had to pull the, to push the red button and to switch off the computer. And that fear, the fear that we can find in many science fiction novels is the computer that's learned to speak. And then it becomes E, becomes a threat. So having that in mind, your question sounds a bit different to what it sounded before. And yes, I would say the language industry has finally picked the intelligence revolution. And I think that it has been done very smartly. In previous generation of machine translation, my domain, data was considered as a mere database in which the machine was to pick already translated parts of sentence or uh, an already translated answered question. It was kind of a smart retrieval process, but it was just a copy past. Neural machine translation is of totally different nature. The way it is trained forced neural network to discover the rules of language. As human has discovered the rules of language with linguistics a um, few centuries ago, and the rules of localization. And every week we hear and uh, we can find a new application of this uh, learning ability that can benefit to the language industry. It sounds like it's here and it's here to stay. Oh, de definitely. I think that it's definitely part of the, of the industry now. Very good. Now, Bob, you also lead a technology company in this space. How do you see us taking advantage of this framework? Thanks, Dave. Um, well, <clears throat> historically, innovation in our industry is all about how we can translate more content faster and of better quality, all of which we have to do at a lower cost. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, much has changed and many aspects of businesses operated in a different way. And this has resulted in an increased innovation in other areas too. For example, how do companies interact with their customers? And how do customers choose and purchase products and services? How do supply chains deliver them? Well, at XTM, we were well prepared to deal with these changes brought on by the pandemic, both with regards to XTM staff who transitioned seamlessly to working from home and also for our customers, thanks to the web-based architecture of XTM Cloud. When we set up XTM International 18 years ago, our guiding principles were that we wanted to provide control over the localization process and assets to the end client, while automating routine tasks and making the interface simple and user-friendly. So from the outset, XTM was web-based, so all users work through a browser and their work is automatically saved on the server. As their work is saved in real time, Project managers have up-to-date metrics and other information about the project. As XTM has a fully integrated CAT tool, all linguists have a complete set of tools to help them work productively. And by building AI into XTM, many decisions are taken by the system, and users only need to check the results or deal with exceptions. So for companies that are struggling with technology during the pandemic, it's not too late to adopt a new way of working by migrating away from legacy systems and using an AI-driven stack, which already exists. And, and Bob, is that now enough, you know, a basic need that companies need to embrace that? They need to understand, look, if you don't have, you, you know, like you, you've mentioned in the story of your company, that you, you foresaw some of these things, uh, they don't have them in place. How can they, you know, quicken their approach? Is it by getting in some of these technology stacks in place? Yeah, I think really the the, the pace of change is increasing, and companies that uh, are lagging behind on the technology curve uh, will become uncompetitive. And so it's, I guess it's it's often a difficult change to make to, to, to introduce new technology, but it's essential if you're to remain competitive. Good. Uh, Marcus Meisel, you're part of a localization group at one of the largest software companies, SAP. Is, is this phenomenon something significant that you see day to day? Does it mean quicker deployment, and smarter and faster deployments because of the intelligence revolution? <laughs> 
I think you used the right wording there in your intro when you talked about the radical transformation of manufacturing. And that radical transformation is now something that, that's happening everywhere because there's incredible advances in computing power and artificial intelligence, machine learning. And what we as a company do is we integrate all that into software systems and through that create a new, a more distributed type of intelligence across all areas of a company because our systems are really made to run complete companies. In fact, the current focus of our company is to help our customers create the intelligent enterprise. That's that's what our, our communication, our collateral say, this is what we want to help our customers establish an intelligent enterprise, which is one that applies advanced technologies and best practices uh, within integrated business processes. That's what we do. Um, that's what we've always done, and we're now doing it with new and emerging technologies. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, it is a very prominent and visible phenomenon. And for localization, it means, amongst other things, quicker development and potentially smarter and faster deployments. Just the fact that we can do it doesn't mean we do do it. Um, but uh, as Bob said at the beginning, um, in the end, innovation in the vast majority of cases is about being faster, being cheaper, creating better quality, and primarily through the use of more technology. That's, that's what usually happens. So, so when I started in my career, uh, doing innovative things was like fun. You know, you'd create scripts for, you know, moving A to B, batch files, all of that. And we, we got a buzz out of it. So you, are you saying it's not fun anymore? It has to always meet the bottom line? Um, it can still be fun. I think when you look at startups, it, it's fun. But uh, I think for large corporations, um, there's almost, you know, there's a forced need to be innovative as well. And it's sometimes very difficult to balance that with your existing business. Yeah. And that rate of change that was mentioned earlier, that uh, Bob mentioned, it's accelerated. And, and I think many of us who have been in this industry um, a long time have seen that acceleration just, you know, it's speeded up, hasn't it? And the deployment of new stuff is happening more quickly. The lead times are, are less and so on. Um, good stuff. And Marcus Casal, you, you've been in the services industry for a good number of years. How would you compare what is happening now, what you've seen over the years? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, right? And at a certain point, it's a question of velocity, right? I mean, revolution, evolution, they converge uh, when the velocity is fast enough. And... I think that's the difference between this moment and previous moments. Um, the pace of change has just really gone, you know, it's, it's hockey sticked up on us. I, I liked Marcus's idea of the intelligent enterprise. I would also say it is increasingly distributed intelligence, right? So, you, you know, a, a traditional model had you know, maybe one or, or a small number of kind of centers of intelligence and centers of ownership and accountability and content creation within an enterprise. And now we see that just really becoming, you know, almost rhizomatic, right? It's all over the enterprise. You have content coming in to global life cycles, whether it's localization, publishing, other things um, throughout. And it's, it's also very different types of content, right? You have marketing content, product support, community, user generated. It's not one directional, right? It's multi-directional, um, peer to peer within an enterprise, you know, to, to Bob's point about, uh, COVID, we're seeing a tremendous increase of companies who need good enough peer to peer, uh, communication between users because they need more binding between them. Um, so, you know, you have velocity, you have distribution, um, it's really distributed networks uh, so that you get the right content in front of the right user at the right time. Uh, at the same time, though, many of the bedrock principles, which is, you know, I need the language quality to be good. I need this to be consistent with my brand voice, which means terminology, style guides. These principles remain, right? And so put these things together, and I think that's what's different about this moment. Tremendous velocity, massive distribution, decentralization of content across these networks. Uh, but at the same time, uh, so sort of endurance of bedrock principles around quality and consistency um, to, to convey that brand's voice to its users. You know, we want to go fast, but we don't want to lose all the perks. So it's, it's a bit like a, an S-Class Mercedes that can drive like a Porsche. Is that what you're saying? Something <laughs> along those lines. 
Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, that just seems to be the way it's become. You know, there was a bit of research done a couple of years ago uh, by a, a gentleman who looked at YouTube videos and he, he's, he looked at the load time for videos and found, this was about five or six years ago, and he found that uh, once the load time was longer than two seconds, on average, people just clicked elsewhere and figured, oh, there's something wrong with the video and went off. So our you know, attention span has gone down to that for YouTube. Now, what he also found was at that time, if we were on a mobile mo platform or mobile device, then we would be just a little bit nicer. We'd give it another two seconds, so four seconds. We, we would adjust our, our feel on what is the right speed for this to load based on the platform we're in. Okay, let's talk about innovation. It is the motive of our discussion after all. So Marcus, let's continue with you. You've been running technology-focused <laughs> org organizations, as was mentioned earlier. Can you talk a bit about how you've seen innovation work and how you manage, focus, and measure the impact of innovations? Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. Um, what we're seeing at this moment, I think, is um, innovation is sometimes distinguishable less by what you see, but increasingly by what you don't see. Uh, so in some ways, localization is becoming invisible, uh, or at least becoming less and less visible. And I think that's that's a very good thing. Or, you know, earlier, I was talking about those distributed networks within brands, within enterprises of where content lives and where content is owned and budgeted and each content having its own life cycle. And being able to meet that content where it is, rather than trying to force it all to where you are, um, is, I think, the most interesting area, uh, or one of the most interesting areas of innovation. It's fundamentally a technology-led uh, strategy. Uh, it's an API and connector strategy. It's not really specific uh, to technology, but I think... Uh, a lot of the industry has gotten a lot smarter about being able to meet that content where it is, uh, where it lives in the wild, and then create those connectivity solutions to get it into um, localization flows. And so, you know, the way you measure the value there is, you know, time to market, uh, velocity, certainly. Um, increasingly, you can also have feedback loops between the performance of the content, its effectiveness, its impact on everything from CSAT to buying decisions decisions and feed that back into localization, which I think is fascinating. So it's not just about meeting the content where it is, but metadata and also performance information about that content and feeding that into a virtuous cycle. So you know, hey, this is working in Spanish, so I'm going to do more of this. Uh, it's not working in German, so I'm going to do less of this, right? Um, I think the other really important thing is, and I know we're going to talk about uh, machine translation, but uh, we're getting, I think, smarter and more nuanced around machine translation. For many years in this industry, it tended to be a binary. Shall we use MT? Shall we not use MT? When is MT useful? Yes, we talked about you know, raw or unattended MT versus uh, post-edited MT, but it was still a fairly simplistic approach. I think we're getting smarter now about the fact that, you know, uh, MT is, again, it's becoming invisible. It's like a utility. It can be served to us, whether by Sistran or by the big um, commercial providers, um, kind of like electricity, right? You can turn it on and you can get your, your current of MT, but, you know, the needs of... Uh, of different customers uh, do vary, right? So you can curate that. You can tune it for specific use cases um, for that globally distributed network. And then, of course, the, the ROI um, calculation uh, also feeds into that virtuous cycle I was talking about earlier. So, and again, right, you measure um, the value of the innovation by that feedback mechanism that you get from your users around your behavior. And then looking forward, what I think is most fascinating fascinating as um, something that I think we're just on the cusp of is um, putting content to of, you know, not just when it's in flight, not just, you know, getting it out there in its life cycle so that users can consume it, but content itself as an incredible 
asset, right? So the notion of a global content lakes that can be mined, yes, for training MT engines. I think we've all been doing that, uh, but also for identifying things like brand voice, uh, effectiveness, right? What types of content resonate with different users? There's still a ton of work to be done around content effectiveness and especially aggregated content effectiveness. So content lakes and uh, MT as a, a utility like electricity. Jean, I need to go back to you, of course. And uh, you know, what do you do about innovation? How do you manage users at Cistron? So you know, when I joined Cistron a long time ago, just a few months be just before we launched the Bubblefish, and uh, for people of my generation, Bubblefish has been mind-blowing. It was the first ever online application where you could translate automatically from one language to another. Just a few months before, I was defending my PhD, and my PhD advisor was firmly believing that English will have to become the only language online on the growing internet. And suddenly, internet was multilingual. It was not unexpected. It was disruptive. It was innovation. Since then, at Cistron, we have continued to fight for that. For, and for us, innovation has always been about being the first. Even when you are in a world with giants, with infinite resources, we have proven that it's possible to, uh, to still be innovative. Three years ago, when Normal Translation was born, we created OpenNMT. Today, it is the largest open source Normal Translation framework. This was innovation. Today, you have Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Salesforce, and so many others that have joined the game of open source frameworks. And we are not anymore the, 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 the only one. And each of them can pretend to be faster, better, smarter, whatever they want, but they can claim that they, are, they have been the first. And this is where you can make the innovation differently. What I think really defines innovation is when a few years after you look back and you forget that there was a before. Uh, the innovation is so deeply part of your day-to-day -day life that you cannot believe that it has to be invented. Who could imagine, can imagine today, internet without, without to translate this page button? Marcus was saying earlier that um, mesh translation has become a commodity. We cannot even imagine living without, without mesh translation. So I, I just want to... Uh, to tune that down a little bit as company, of course, being the first is not enough. And uh, you have to continue. And you always have to think about the next step, uh, observing the others, improve concepts, uh, uh, making cool adaptation, making them faster, but thinking what is the next big thing and not just improving it. Yeah, being the first is, is key, isn't it? First mover advantage. Um, getting your product out there, moving from innovation to productization to co commercialization. Um, but as you said, you, you know it's it's not enough. It's uh, there, there's more to do after that. And uh, so so great. Thank you, Jean, for that. And, and Bob, um, has your organization XTM International always been innovative? How do you manage innovation and indeed the risks associated with innovation? Uh, including disruption. Thanks, Dave. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm a firm believer that an organization is innovative through its culture. And this comes firstly from employing exceptional people, which in our case is often straight out of a university, and then empowering them and giving them the space and time to pursue innovative ideas. Yet this all has to be in a structured, controlled environment. For example, we have a fantastic NLP team led by Dr. Rafael Jaworski in Poznan, Poland, and Andy Zydron, our CTO. This team has developed a unique technology called Interlanguage Vector Space that underpins um, a lot of our AI functionality. Now, external disruption um, can be a threat to any business, however large and successful they are today. And it, this disruption can arise from existing competition, new startups, or changes in the market. As an example, look at Kodak. They had a dominant position in photographic film. But despite developing the first self-contained digital camera, they were not able to adapt quickly enough to the digital photography revolution, eventually filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2012. So the important things really are to watch the trends in the market, be agile, and be open-minded 
and accept new ideas. Um, as a little motto, your best defense against disruption is a disruptive attack. So if you're not thinking about what disruption can happen to you, then it may well surprise you when it happens. Um, Bob, I, I hope you didn't read that in this book here. Um, <laughs> I was, you just reminded me with the Kodak example. There's some great books on innovation, which many of you may have read. You know, this is the Christensen book. Yeah. Innovator's Dilemma. Crossing the Chasm. Really good book by Jeffrey Moore. Uh, one you mightn't have heard of is uh, The Invisible Advantage. Um, which is a modern take by Soren Kaplan on the innovation culture, which we're going to talk to shortly. Uh, this isn't book club, but you know I have to show this one as well. Very innovative book by two gents, which may be watching the show. Um, my favorite is this one. Um, it's a 20-year-old book written by Bert Esslink. Many engineers, and I'm looking at you, Marcus Casal, probably had it on their shelf. Uh, I, I even looked this up last year. It's still a good book. Imagine 20 years later, shout out to you, Bert, if you're watching us. Um, but I think very va valid points there, Bob. Um, you, you've got to watch out for disruption because Kodak have, had everything lined up, didn't they? They did. And they have to. Have, you have to look at them and say, gosh, you know, would you have done anything different in their situation? It's very easy in in hindsight to say you would, but in you know you imagine you were running that company or part of the board of directors. How would you have played it differently? Um, and as I say, the, the key thing is to be open minded and keep a very close watch on what's happening in the industry. Yeah, very good. And uh, Marcus Meisel, um at SAP, you know there must have been a variety of approaches to innovation over the years. Um, I recently signed up for an open SAP course called Get Started with Innovation Culture. So it's, it's clearly an advanced and very important part of what the organization does. Can you give us some insight on how innovation works there? Yeah, I can try. Um, so innovation, especially in the software industry, is absolutely paramount to being successful as a company. And that's even more so if you're listed at the stock exchange, you need to meet analysts and investors' expectations that are usually tied to disruptive innovation, whatever that means in detail. And then that also applies to the language and services and technology department of such a large software company. Because we serve our internal departments, they give us what they need translated and localized. And therefore, we're also the first ones to be hit by all that innovation that's created in engineering, in the marketing department, in training departments, any, anyone creating content and text. Uh, for us, innovation means primarily new tools, new formats, uh, new types of automation. And as a department, we need to integrate into all of that. So SAP, as you know, is a huge company with many different approaches to creating innovation. We have a research department that works on basic foundational research topics. We have a global innovation center network where multidisciplinary teams from five locations globally um, explore emerging technologies and then try to find out what their value for business and society is, and also how to solve industry problems. One example, one more recent example for that is the German COVID-19 war app that's been downloaded about 20 million times. That was developed by uh, our colleagues in the Innovation Center Network. We have um, so-called co-innovation centers. We call them the App House uh, in several locations around the world where our customers get together with designers and engineers and design thinking coaches from SAP to develop technology-based ways to meet their business needs. Um, we have a startup incubator, SAP IO, and we organize numerous internal idea management competitions and hackathons to identify the ideas uh, that are out there in the 100,000 brains behind SAP, and then to further develop the ideas that promise to be successful new products, new processes, and business models. So it's not only about products. So from all these different approaches, you can see that creating an environment and a culture is key, uh, an environment and a culture that gives every colleague the opportunity and the confidence to actually think outside of their regular comfort zone. 
In the end, for me, innovation is largely a matter of perspective. It all depends on where you are today and what's new and what's different for you. Maybe an example from our department. So we have a wonderful big ecosystem of more than 100 suppliers that we work with. And we always closely collaborate with them on improving our processes, um, especially through automation. While some of our suppliers work primarily with Excel, others are pretty much at eye level with us in terms of level of automation with translation memory systems um, that in part they've written uh, themselves, uh, workflow systems and all that. So what we ask our suppliers to do is groundbreaking innovation for some and nothing new for others. So it really depends very much on where you start out with. Right, that makes a lot of sense. So you, you have people at different levels of their innovation maturity. Um, so th thank you all, some good insights on, on how it's managed some risks on disruption and cultural aspects to keep in mind. Um, let's change tack slightly and uh, let's discuss some of the, the key AI-based technologies in our industry. Um, by the way, uh, please keep your questions coming in. Uh, we will take more of those at the end. If there's something that's just uh, segueing nicely in the discussion, then we'll, we'll take it as part of the discussion. Otherwise, we'll come back towards the end of the discussion. And uh, the Pew Center Fact Tank um, found right that the share of U.S. adults who say they use the internet, use social media, you own a smartphone or own a tablet are nearly identical to the share who said the same thing in 2016. Now, that's probably not surprising, right? So this is the flattening of the curve of the technology being adopted. Uh, much of the population has reached near saturation levels in the adoption of some technologies. Simply put, there aren't many non-users left in that uh, particular area. As many of us know who have been in this industry, machine translation has been around for quite a while, uh, and in latter years has grown adoption. It's it's evolved, you know, neural MT. Have we reached a technology saturation point with uh, technologies like neural MT? Jean, your company is leading edge on neural MT technologies. Ha has the innovation been done? Where do we go from here? Yes, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I really like it, and you are using past tense, and I do believe it's legitimate. And MT, and MT innovation has been done. At the very moment, the idea of using neural network on text, using word embeddings and through sequence to sequence uh, approach came. This was the innovation moment. And this in NMT innovation has been done. It was disruptive then, it was unexpected. And in a few months, it changed everything, totally changed the research and machine translation. And only a few months later, it changed the industry. Uh, since then, there has been some improvement, quite a lot the first year and less and less over the, la on the following years. NMT as a tool, NMT innovation as a tool, I think is done. And um, if you come back to your analogy of electricity, you, electricity has been done once. And after it has been improved, the network has been changed, the delivery has, has been done, but electric, electricity innovation was a very short period of time. And we can still improve marginally the design of the network, the contextual information you are feeding to the network, the algorithm that implements the, the neural network, the scale at which you want to use it. But from my perspective, innovation is complete. And as I was saying before, if you think about the next step, it's not in the design and the research of neural network anymore. It's somewhere else. So what we believe uh, is that the next step uh, and what we at Istran are really looking at, the, the next step of the innovation on uh, neural MT is how this tool can be used to connect the expert and the user of the technology. In the world of language and localization, the expert is not in a um, in laboratory or in the Silicon Valley or, or somewhere out of uh, engineering school. The expert is the one dealing with the daily translation tasks for domains and language all around the world. And it's by nature of the, of the industry, it needs to be everywhere. It is everywhere. The expert is, is in India, is in Greece, is everywhere. It is where the expert and the most valuable people are. We have more than 1,000 active languages in the world and hundreds of domains like legal, health, IT, and it is what localization is about. And I believe that it's time to give back the power and responsibility coming with normal uh, machine translation to the actual expert and to make uh, them distribute their knowledge on a far larger scale. We call that the marketplace where the language expert 
the, the translator can create translation model, could create translation model, and distribute them worldwide. While the user, the buyer, who want this, you want to have the best uh, uh, elf um, Greek uh, English system. Then you will go directly to the to the source, to the to the one that can produce that, and not to the researcher, to the, to the actual expert. And I really think this is the next big thing that we need to uh, to do in the industry. Wow, thank you, Jean. A lot to absorb there. Uh, so it's you, you you're saying that you know we've reached some point of saturation. Now it's Take the utility and find better ways of using it, uh, you, you know, managing it, I guess, and optimizing it. Yeah, and making electricity arrive at every home in the world. Right. And, and you know, if anyone knows about electricity networks, you know, load balancing is, is the thing that they're always challenged with. You know, so the, 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 the baseline innovation is there, done and dusted, all of the control technology for management is there, but load balancing is still like an ongoing challenge um, even to this day. So, good. Uh, that's optimistic, Sean. Uh, it gives us all a bit of hope as well. <laughs> right? Um, very useful these days. And uh, Marcus Meisel, so is NMT done? What, what about application deployment of those types of solutions? Is can they be a panacea for a company like SAP? Well, as the person with the least technical background of all these panelists here, uh, my input might not be that useful. But in my role as a manager of the department, I'm convinced that it's not done yet, at least not on the deployment and the quality side. I think there's lots of work to be done there still. So obviously, there are quite a few applications around uh, in the world, also at SAP, especially around customer support. Um, but we also have many other use cases where colleagues come to our department and say, hey, I hear you've got machine translation and I have a wonderful use case. And what I need for that use case is I need my translation instantly, I need it for free, and I need it in top quality. And you know, with machine translation, you should be able to do that, right? So that's the assumption and the expectation um, especially because most of them know the uh, the lovely, really well-known free MT engines on the net that actually provide incredible quality for certain purposes. But if you have a relatively limited view of what MT can achieve today, and many of those colleagues believe it is the panacea, it is the be-all, end-all, um, as a department, we usually have to set the record a little bit straight and provide them with a realistic assessment or a more realistic assessment of what makes sense at the current stage of development and for their use case. Um, and quite often, they don't really like to hear all the details. So some topics that we're currently working on that are definitely not done yet is uh, domain-aware MT, um, as Jean mentioned for example, on industry-specific uh, use cases, the ability to pull the right term for something that might be the same term in the source language, but different in certain industry. And also the integration of RMT with our conversational AI technology. Um, the goal there is to create multilingual chatbots very quickly. So there's still a lot of stuff to explore and invent, and the backlog for RMT team is still very full, which is a good thing. Uh, right, and is, I, I don't know if you mentioned th that team. Is is that in in place for a long period of time? Is that something that SAP has kind of always been keeping an eye on? You, you know, tell us a little bit about that. We have we actually have a very long history with machine translation, um, all the way back into the nineties. But obviously, that was very different technology um, when statistical MT was commonplace. We started building a team, I believe it must have been about six or seven years ago, and then we really jumped on the, the NMT bandwagon, and we've got some great people with a research background that, that joined our team, um, and we're constantly expanding on that. Excellent. Thanks very much, Marcus. And, and Bob, your company is a TMS provider. Um, have you developed your own MT solutions? Well, actually, we chose not to develop our own MT solution um, as we saw this as a very competitive field where the big tech companies such as SAP um, have huge resources and were able to invest large sums of money over a long period. So, in short, it was an area we felt we couldn't compete and there are other areas of a TMS that we could add greater value. 
Um, and so we chose to invest in, in other important TMS functions. But our aim is to gear all our developments in XTM to produce tangible benefits uh, for users. So the AI features that we have to produce um, must produce business results. Like many companies, not all our developments have been a commercial success. So we're not afraid to fail and move on with other initiatives. By adding AI to modules that already existed in XTM, we have dramatically increased performance in such areas as bilingual terminology extraction, alignment, and additional automated features for translators in the workbench. So don't reinvent the wheel. Use best of breed systems that are out there and integrate well. Integration is the name of the game, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And, and Marcus Casal, you, you, you know, wh what do you think on integration? Should MT be a public utility? This has come up already. Is it a is a proprietary secret sauce? Should it be on premise? Should it be fit for for a purpose? You know, what, what's your view on this? Yeah, uh, I think generally, yes, it's a, it's a public utility. Um, uh, now, with that said, just like with electricity, right, the uh, electrical needs of a factory, of an office building, and of a private residence are quite different. And you have to know what you're doing. And certainly, there are some facilities, right, very high-value, secure facilities that need to generate their own power. And there's, you know, facilities that are, you know, there's mechanisms, there's places that are going to need their own on-prem uh, MT. But I think the broader set of use cases is about curating and tuning what is out there and making the decision okay are you a factory are you you know uh an office building are you a block of flats are you a private residence um and then tuning the the utility tuning the machine translation um and curating it so that um you know uh, at the end of the day the actual manufacturers, the tech companies, uh, whether they're, you know, the big ones or even the smaller ones, um, can't tune the engines for the specific customer use case. They, they just, that's not their business model. Um, and so that I think is increasingly the role of the LSPs and other language providers, um, around deploying it effectively in the context of you know that distributed uh, set of of uh, enterprise content networks that exist today, um, and it's also about um, uh, really that life cycle and the language manufacturing. So I don't think it's saturated. Uh, I mean, there's evolution that's going to happen within machine translation itself, you know, with the shift from um, today's neural models to potentially neural Turing machines as the next paradigm. Uh, but I think, uh, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done around, you know, semantic translation, um, lexical fidelity versus fluency. I mean, there's, there's, room to grow there but i think from the provider perspective you know there's room to grow on the technology side but from the provider perspective it's really about that thoughtful curation and fit to purpose and understanding very intimately right what each customer's needs are and within the customer where the different um, needs of their content uh, where the different needs of their content live and and what those needs are very interesting. And uh, I think you just won today's bingo game with lexical fidelity. Great. Um, <laughs> What's the <so>, prize? <laughs> <laughs> You'll find out later. So, look, at this point, uh, let's do a quick uh, refresh. So, audience, uh, hopefully you're still there and listening. Uh, we'd like to ask you a question. So, do you think machine translation technologies are reaching saturation points? So, point we've discussed a little bit. So you have a couple of options. No way. It's still strong innovation. Or option two, MT technology still have a bit to go. Three, eh, innovation slowing down, but deployment levels still have a ways to go. And four, yes, we need something new and shiny, please. And five, well, whatever the panelists say, you know, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> so please um, make your vote and hopefully we can have a look at uh, what you have to say. No way. NMT is strange. Still a strong innovation playground. Wow, 38%, followed by MT Technologies, 
still have a bit to go on their innovation. Uh, thank you very much, Nick and team, for running that and for you t for taking part. And uh, panelists, what do you think? Is that surprising? John, what do you reckon? No, I think the way the question were, were asked is very interesting. I do believe in the one, in the two, and the three, in fact, uh, because we can read them as we want. NMT is still a strong innovation playground, yes. Uh, not necessarily on NMT itself, but probably on what is around. And uh, you can read the other question the same way. So I, I do agree on the three. I would have voted for the three first. What other AI innovations or outside of AI innovations are out there in our industry at the moment? Um, Bob, let's start with you. Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned in the previous um, round or topic, uh, at XTM we have developed MT, but we have focused our efforts around uh, a technology called interlanguage vector space. So let me tell you a bit about ILVS, as we call it. ILVS is a neural network-based technology that we have built. Um, it's based on research by Google and Facebook around vector space that XTM has enhanced by using data from bilingual dictionaries. This is data we've harvested uh, from the internet um, and certainly not from any customer data. Um, and we've used this, these dictionaries to align the vector spaces. This enables ILVS to detect potential translation candidates, even if they never appeared in a dictionary. For this reason, when performing a, the task of building multilingual terminology glossaries, ILVS can detect even highly specialized narrow domain terms and gives us a huge benefit. In fact, users um, who are using ILVS can automate up to 90% of their bilingual term extraction. We've also been able to enhance other features in XTEM by using ILVS. These include auto alignment, uh, auto inline element placement. So that means that within the workbench where you have inlines that represent uh, formatting in the text, they can be placed automatically by uh, the system and the, the user only has to check that they're in the right place. And of course, in bilingual terminology extraction. So when you're doing an alignment, you can very easily uh, generate bilingual terms that you can then import into your term base. So, uh, Bob, is the, the, the interlanguage vector space, then is that, is that really a fundamental um, technology framework? Um, you know, how can you liken it to? What, what yeah, it's, it's, it's it? really the, the building blocks for um, that we are using to add automation to many processes within XTM. And... Um, it, it, it's something that, that we have built ourselves and will will continue to to build on and add additional features features in the future. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much. And Marcus Meisel, back to you. In the in the soft, um, you, you know, you're in the software industry. Uh, of course, there's going to be lots of innovations that you see. Is there anything that comes to mind inside or outside of the AI, AI space? Um, in general, in the software industry, and that also applies to, to uh, the localization side of things, it's, it's the openness and the, the connectivity that are key. I think uh, Bob mentioned it before. So in the cloud world, that would mean an open architecture based on web services. And as a company, we've got a cloud-based development platform that contains a toolbox of services that customers can then use to design their own processes as they need it. I mean, historically, we've given them everything um, ready-made, more or less, um, with a flexible architecture, they can build it all themselves. Part of that toolbox are also our MT and our text suggest suggestion services, and um, we're planning to add more at that end as well. And all the different engineering departments at SAP uh, are working on incorporating different platforms, features, and functions. So we integrate AI into pretty much everything we do into the HR applications, financials, logistics, and so on. We put in conversational technologies that I've mentioned before. We're putting in robotic process automation that we actually have done a little bit in our department as well. 
We've got IoT stuff uh, and, and numerous intelligent data-related services. Um, customers are specifically asking for predictive capabilities because we all like to know more about what might happen in the future. And so the expectation is also that we as a department do that and we do it within our own realm and with our, um, with our resources. But as a department, we also explore other opportunities for innovation. Um, so we, we like to be involved in collaborative research projects. For example, we're part of a consortium project called Speaker that's um, designed to create a voice assistant system um, for the European market that also safeguards European standards of data security. We know that American Chinese companies are a little bit ahead there, um, but we also have our issues with some of the data protection rules. Um, and likewise, coming back to, to machine translation, we've got some cooperation on, on NMT topics with universities in China and Japan. So it's a very broad field, especially with a company that offers such a toolbox of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning tools. Right, right. And it's quite extensive as well. And it looks like there's some some things which are in existing, other things are future focused. And, and Jean, would you, you know, take a similar approach or... or how, how do you look at innovation within or outside of the AI uh, piece? Um, the, the the first thing is that we the 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 what we are doing day to day is to make it better. So uh, NMT we can still improve by doing a lot of things, and and this definitely is uh, is important. And uh, uh, but I don't call that innovation. But when I look at uh, NMT, what you have achieved as NMT, NMT is, a, is, is, is built on this very weird technology that we must admit we don't understand. Nobody really understands what is this technology. Uh, Bob was mentioning using ve vector space to uh, for other applications. Vector space is one of the components of the of the, the technology we are using today. So what is exciting is that we have this powerful technology that we don't fully understand and we can think how to make new applications out of that. And what I like usually to do is to look at the big picture. What are we trying to do in the localization industry? We want to make people communicate together. We want to make people understand each other. So if you look at the complete chain, there is not only the translator. There is the At the very beginning, there is the, the writer, the technical writer. What if we can produce a tool that can produce, that can translate as we write immediately? Not as a translation that comes before, but the, the writer will be a multilingual writer. This is one application that we are looking at. Another one is what if we can not translate for the human translator or helping go faster, but try to correct and identify what is what is incorrect, what is unlikely in a, in a human translation um, uh, sentence. This would be exciting. It's, it would help a lot of people just. Um, not only on the localization industry, but also people who want to learn language, how we can help that learning and spot uh, errors that they are making that are incorrect. We cannot do that today, but with the tools, we have the technology, we could. And the last part is, um, we, if we were able to help users more globally to learn language faster, to be able to acquire new language ability without needing any translation, it will be even better. And I believe that there is component in the, in the, in the core uh, bricks of what we have introduced for NMT that we can use for that. So you're hearing it here first, folks. Uh, this multilingual authoring, uh, the translation checker, uh, sort of proofing tools for language, uh, and, and then the integration with language learning, inter language vector space and uh, the speaker initiative. Some good stuff there. I hope you're all taking notes, by the way. Um, Mar Marcus Casal, you know, turn to you. H has MT blurred the ground for other innovations being seen? And now is their time? Like, it's the big mountain, you know, behind the mountain, there's hills, valleys, and, you know, playgrounds and all this kind of stuff. But we can't see them. No, I think that's a really good analogy. Um, indeed, you know, we... MT has been so impactful. It's been transformative, right? I mean, whatever, whatever you know, superlatives you wish, it it really has transformed this industry. But um, we spend so much time thinking about MT, and and then more generally, right, thinking about um, other technology that we can use to produce language, right, to do the translation uh, faster, cheaper, better, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That we sometimes 
forget that there's other ways or we pay less attention to ways in which machine learning and and artificial intelligence can support global content life cycles right and here you know there's this whole other technical infrastructure right i mean some of the things i was starting with earlier and i think bob uh bob talked about this as well you know the importance of connectivity right uh a smart api first approach so that you can get content in um and then behind that right you're talking about um routing that content based on machine learning so that you can identify the right workflow based on inherent characteristics of the content. So far, you know, very often the whole industry says, well, you know, what is this stuff? You know, and we ask a human to tell us about the content. Much cooler is if the systems can tell you about the content. So it doesn't matter whether the human has read the content or is familiar with the content or if the content is what the human thinks it is. The system is now telling you things like, you know, semantics and um, complexity and translatability and suitability for machine translation. So smart routing of the content, smart routing to workers. At the end of the day, you need humans to do value-added activities, uh, but which workers are, are the right ones, right? Again, so far we've operated under models where we have people tell us about content, we have people tell us about other people. Increasingly, we need systems to be able to tell us about content, systems to be able to tell us uh, about people. And I think these are other areas where the language uh, industry can and should excel. I mean, to me, this is this is really uh, part of the secret sauce uh, because the machine translation itself is a utility. Yes, we can curate it, we can tune it, we can adapt it. But then being able to use smart systems for many of these other things around routing, workflow, what requires more attention, what requires less, what is higher risk, lower risk, um, that I think is the new frontier of... Uh, of AI and machine learning in the in the global content lifecycle space. Wow, thank you very much, Marcus. That's um, a lot of stuff there. But I think the a common point that seems to be emerging is that you know there, there's a platform there, and now we can do stuff on top of it and and uh, start to to innovate again on, on the back of the of giants, if you like, on the platforms that exist around NMT. We'll start wrapping up short, shortly, folks, but I just want to ask a little bit about examples of innovation. So I, I chair an innovation platform called the Process Innovation Challenge, which is one of the innovation platforms in the industry uh, as part of Lock Worldwide. We're going to have the next one in January, by the way. Uh, we see a wide abundance of innovations and innovative ideas to improve process uh, or change how certain things are done or use an old innovation to solve a new problem. Um, the last two winners were in the area of automatic AI video dubbing and voiceover. And that area is, is just generally getting more focus, isn't it? Right. We're doing more videos. We see a lot more content on those platforms. Podcasting, of course, is now de rigor. Uh, so have you seen good examples of innovation recently and trends in innovation in our industry? You know, how should people get their innovations out there and where should they focus their attention? Um, Bob, can we start with you briefly? Um, yeah, so MT isn't the only way that AI is affecting the localization sector. Um, in addition, addition to facilitating translation of content, AI is actually now being used to create content from original in, in original format. So various technologies have been successfully deployed to synthesize human-generated content from diverse data sources. Effectively, they... This AI is replicating the work done by traditional reporters or analysts. And obviously, as this, this technology um, is more widely adopted, then more content will be created. And obviously, it will need more localization. So, and, and, and a second area that um, I think will be affecting the industry um, significantly in the, in the coming years will be um, the move to voice uh, operation of devices. This will change the way in which both hardware and software are localized for international consumers. Tools will be, which were previously controlled via a text-based or computer interface, will evolve to include a new layer of voice commands. These require an 
accompanying tier of language support together with a wealth of data to train machine learning engines on accurate recognition of language, accents, and dialects. And, and the last area, as Dave mentioned, I, I can see is in audio and video formats. So this is an area which is increasingly um, being used uh, in marketing and all, all areas in training. So it's, it's the localization of, uh, of the audio and the uh, subtitling is, is very important. Right. Very good. And Marcus Meisel, uh, for, from your perspective, what are you seeing? Well, you mentioned the pick. That was a fun event, and uh, I had the pleasure of participating there. Um, there. There was one thing that really caught my attention, although my fellow Dragons didn't think it was so innovative, and it was uh, basically the framework um, that would allow uh, to raise and resolve internationalization problems where they should be resolved, somewhere upstream before they ever hit localization. It's not a new topic, uh, but when I look at it from, from like a large corporation's perspective, it's still a very expensive topic. So that would be innovation that might not be disruptive, um, but very helpful in terms of cost savings and, and saving us a lot of pain that we otherwise still go through 30 years after we figured out that localization, uh, the, sorry, that uh, internationalization is a problem. So. That's where I see a really important innovation still. Right. In internationalization, uh, still an evergreen in terms of being able to evolve it as new um, code base and platforms come on stream. Um, good one. And, and is, isn't it in the eye of the beholder as well, Marcus, that you know, if you see something as superbly innovative and someone else says, well, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it it to, kind of corroborates what I said before. Like it really depends on where you are and where you start from. Excellent. And Marcus Casal, um, you know, wh what have you seen? Examples of great innovations. I so I'm, I'm thinking back. I don't remember if it was a pick challenge or similar at uh, at a gala event. But you know, sometimes again, keeping with the idea of of sometimes innovation is taking away. Um, the um, an experiment that somebody got a payment processor, uh, a credit card processor, to do with their mobile apps, which was to actually not localize it, right? To um, hire folks in country to um, to simply create it, right? They gave them the framework, they removed the source English strings, and said, you know what here's what should happen in each area. You had descriptive text, uh, but really an event in kind of extreme transcreation. And that to me is very exciting because, you know, sometimes, um, especially, you know, for those of us who, who come from a language background, who, who love language, this sometimes feels very grim, right? All you techies are just automating away all the joy out of this and all the, all the human out of it. And as Jean was saying, I mean, human language is a, a defining human characteristic. But in fact, one of the most innovative things I see is the way that, sure, automating the routine, uh, making the routine cheaper and faster opens up space for something like this, which is, you know, uh, really creative, much more satisfying work for humans in different areas, um, making things work in market uh, as opposed to just uh, to just localizing them. And if you can free up some budget and some time and some energy uh, by using MT and other things over here and being able to put it into creating a great experience for your users in language, then then wonderful. So that that's one of the most, I think, uh, exciting things I've seen recently. Right. And that's the you do it for the users in, in improve customer experience. And then yeah. bottom line will come uh, potentially later. Uh, in fact, that was at the peak. It was uh, Julia Tarditi from Moniz, um, who's still innovating, by the way, we was talking to her recently. So, yeah, no, great example, really. And well worth looking up anyone who hasn't seen yes. that innovation. Uh, yeah, fantastic. So, hey, let's start wrapping up here. Where to now? So, uh, what will innovation localization exist in two years? What will be mainstream in five? John, over to you. It's not easy to, but uh, with all that was said, but I would I would say that the, the innovation will come when the engin engineers will be able to get the end user ask the question that they really want to answer if they knew it was possible. So there is kind of a lockdown situation between 
the the innovators, the, the engineers, and the user. Because the user don't ask the question because they think that it's not possible, and the engineers don't think about the question because they don't know that it's what the, real, the end user really wants. And um, innovation comes when we enable this type of transition. When suddenly there is the the sm small thing that say, oh, but what if you were able to do that? And the engineers, oh yes, we can do that. And then we arrive to innovation. There is something new coming. And we talk about MT as if it was a solution, a tool. It's it's just it, it's just something that someone invented someday for a specific need. Maybe we need something else now, but uh, we don't know exactly what, how, and we need to have more interaction with the end user to, to get that out. And it will come, I'm sure, because technologically we have so much that we can do today that we need to get the right question now. Yeah, very good points there. And, um, you know, Bob, what are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, two years' time, five years' time? Yeah, so I th I think productizing the solution. And it's, you know, Jean made the point earlier that um, it's very important to being the f first mover in the market. But um, it's not always the first mover. Sure, it's important, but it's not always the first mover who ends up as the winner. I mean, and there are multiple examples of that. You know, take Apple, for example. They're rarely the first um, uh, movers in, in, in the market. They, they, they tend to sit back a bit and then produce the killer product. So um, that, I think, but being able to commercialize the innovation and productize it and really uh, do that at the right time is the key thing. Thanks very much, Bob. And uh, Marcus Casal, how do you see the future? What's your crystal ball telling you? Right. So, you know, <laughs> you're, it's always dangerous, but I, I would extend what I was saying earlier. I think what we're going to see more is um, really technology-led um, global content lifecycle management in, in two key areas, right? One is um, extreme connectivity and agility around content in and out. And the other is around using smart systems, um, you know, whether they're being driven by uh, machine learning and AI or simply just by, you know, aggregating content into, you know, content lakes, but using smart systems that are adding value to the performance, the ROI, the effectiveness of content um, in ways that we generally don't today. So I, I would be looking for both of those. And indeed, you know, we're working on both of those. Smart systems. Excellent. And uh, uh, Marcus Meisel, what, what are your thoughts on this uh, couple of years' time? What are we going to see? So, so my, my predictive capabilities are equally limited uh, as yours. Uh, but uh, so may, maybe you wish for the next two years. I hope there will be maybe disrupt the probably more incremental increases in, in NMT that will help to then very quickly create multilingual support materials for crisis situations in regions where languages are spoken, where we don't have billions and billions of words for training material. That would really help and be a huge step for organizations like Translators Without Borders uh, to help the local populations. That's more of a personal wish. And maybe in five years, who knows, we might be close to a combination of the babblefish from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the Star Trek communicator. So something like building on the technology that Marcus just mentioned, you know, getting to a multilingual voice processing thing that happens real time somewhere in the background while I'm comfortably chatting with someone whose language I don't speak. I think that would be a pretty cool scenario. <laughs> right. So you mean like the, the scene of Scotty, the engineer in Star Trek Four, right? When he says, hello, computer. <laughs> Sorry for anyone who hasn't seen that film, should look it up. Uh, thanks very much, Marcus. And hey, look, um, let's take some questions from the audience. So we've had some coming in. Uh, let, let's start with this one. So there are so many duplicate tools like client and review portals, TMS, terminology management systems being developed by LSPs and enterprise groups. What do you think about perspectives of in-house systems versus uh, systems that are developed for the market by dedicated software companies. So what do you think on that? Anyone want to jump in there? Marcus Casal? So I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and look, 
you know, on some level, many of these tools do similar things, but but I actually think they're different, right? Um, you know, the same way that, you know, continue the analogy, right? A station wagon and a sports car and a pickup truck, yes, they all get you a school bus, right? They all get you from one place to another, uh, but they're designed for different uh, use cases and different buyers. So um, I think, you know, the, the key thing is, Technology has to be fit for purpose, right? There isn't such a thing as a general purpose um, TMS. I mean, if there ever was, there certainly isn't now, right? So um, you're you're focusing on the needs of the enterprise um, uh, in some cases, right? If you're trying to sell the technology to them. Uh, in our cases, what we're trying to do is to really focus the technology on improving our own value add, right? Some of what I was mentioning, being able to find the content wherever it sits, being able to process the content as efficiently as possible, being able to partner with our customers around uh, content performance. Um, and that really isn't designed for other use cases. That's really designed to optimize the value of our services offering. So, you know, while there is some functional duplication, um, I think the the audience and the use cases are, are quite different, Um uh, across the, the range of technology. Wow, lots of stuff in there. Thanks, Marcus. Anyone else want sure, to add to that I, one? Yeah, I, I have an opinion. <laughs> um, so, you know, having um, built a TMS over the last 18 years, I know how difficult it is to actually build a fully functional TMS with cat tool and workflow and all the bells and whistles that you need to be fully productive. Um, <clears throat> however, if if a, um, a company or, a, or an LSP has a specific use case, and this is kind of expanding on what Marcus was saying, if it's a specific use case where they have very defined requirements, then absolutely build it yourself. But if you have a, uh, a more general um, requirement and you don't really know next week what you're going to be asked to process, then I think it's very difficult to to start from scratch and build something yourself. And you know the the old adage, you know, why reinvent the wheel? If 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 there are products out there, it will undoubtedly be cheaper and quicker to take a, a product um, that's available commercially. Great point. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, let's take another question. And, and Bob, this has your name on it as well. So Bob <laughs> says, innovation happens in a structured and controlled environment. Uh, a lot of people might think creativity is a product of unbridled brainstorming sessions or, in the case of the questioner, long bike rides. Yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> uh, what do you say to those who believe innovation is at the heart of, uh, is at its heart a product of unstructured exploration. Wow. That's, that's, it, that's it. That's a great question and a great point. Um, I think um, in a commercial environment, and, you know, and I'm talking about our company, which is a relatively small company, um, we don't have the luxury of, say, SAP, where we have... Um, um, sort of innovation labs and, and and a lot of a lot of people who can work on these things we have to be structured um, we can't have people who are going off and just following a whim because you know we couldn't we just couldn't be able to afford that so we need we need to have people who are able to think creatively um, and then provide the structure and the environment in which that can happen so it's it's um, I think a necessity on our behalf, we would love to be able to have, um, have have the facility for people to go off and on bike rides to have um, creative thoughts. Right. Can so I, it's a balance between the creative and the yes. You know, That's exactly it. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can I add something to that? Uh, especially because <laughs> Bob raised our company as one that has <laughs> endless amounts of money to throw at innovation. Um, I, I I would agree that you need a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, dandelion breaks and so on to come up with good ideas. But in the end, innovation is not only about the ideas. It's about actually getting on the road. Bob, you talked about the commercialization, the productization. Mm. The ideas themselves yeah. don't really do very much. You know, if you give people the environment, be it the physical or the emotional environment to, to, to come up with ideas and give them the confidence to stand up and say, here, yeah, I've got this really cool thought. Um, let's talk about how to do this. 
that's very important. But then afterwards, you need a structure to help them through a very long process of actually thinking through every single step that needs to happen to turn it into a product, to turn it into a new business model and so on. And, and yep. for that sort of thing, you, at SAP, we've got the design thinking coaches, which are now everywhere else as well. But about 15 years ago, one of our co-founders found this methodology and actually funded two university institutes that now teach this. And this is what really makes a big difference because they help you to get out the ideas, but they also help you through the next steps of the process and they create the environment and in the end the culture to to make things possible i think that's one of the books i missed marcus was <laughs> something on design thinking um, very very important and if anyone um hasn't seen marcus talk about design thinking uh, i would definitely invite you to do so uh he, he really knows his stuff so yeah, great stuff there anyone else got um a point on this question we have a couple of other questions, by the way. Okay. Uh, we, we still have about 10 minutes in this session. Uh, so we'll take your questions and, and then wrap up. So uh, what does the industry need to promote more innovation? Um, I, I mentioned a platform earlier, the Process Innovation Challenge, um, and there are others. Uh, but what, what do we need to promote more innovation? Uh, Marcus Cassell? So that's, that's interesting, right? Because... In many ways, the industry, I think, is is a good laboratory of innovation. I mean, if you think about it, um, it's a very distributed industry. The biggest players control a relatively small fraction of it. There's competition at every segment. So, you know, we, we all innovate to, to survive. Um, now, it isn't an industry that traditionally has had the funding and the ability to do some of the larger, you know, there's no uh, X challenge, right, in in our industry um but um but i think you know the the other things we can do is i mean many of us do have good academic partnerships and you're seeing um you know ourselves included um and you're seeing even relatively small companies now have access to academic partnerships to um frameworks and foundations for um innovation and then of course you also have in some ways the democratization of some of this technology uh where you know something like Open NMT um, means that you can and do tinker with it, um, but uh, fundamentally, I agree with with Bob and Marcus. There are lots of good ideas, and you do need those dandelion moments. I love it, right? But you do need those moments on the bike, uh, in the shower, with in a field of flowers, um, to reflect and have those ideas. Uh, but then you have to get back to your more structured environment and productize it, commercialize it, build it, right? And uh, and to some extent, I think that's that's where I like to focus. Yeah, very interesting. And Jean, what are your thoughts on that? How do we promote more innovation, bring more innovation culture to play? I, I, I would concur with uh, with Marcus here, and I think that openness is um, is definitely one way to uh, to promote more innovation. So we are at a time where things are going too fast. And um, we we need to open most of the most most of the technology development because not a single player alone can go fast enough. And um, it is it has been true for the last three, three years, and it is very important on the technology side. It's not true yet on the data side. And I think that we need to think more about data for, and think about recognition of the actual data owner today. It's not the case. The, someone who can just grab data online and think that it's, it's it just is because he, he, he was able to grasp it, he, he, he should not be able to commercialize it. So we need to think about this, the the owners, data owners, because if we in, increase the um, the the share to the people that actually provide generate content, then we will enable more innovation, more opportunities to 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 make more business. Uh, otherwise, we'll just get some monopoly of few players that will just dispute something that they have stolen online. <laughs> I like that. Uh, hey, let's take another question. Um, so there's a question here talking about the ethics, um, and and it's it's if I'm reading correctly, um, uh, the person who asked this, it's who is describing and explaining, you know, these innovations to constituents and stakeholders of cultural rights as human rights. So what, what, 
what's the ethics challenge and is that being met you know it in in, in terms of some of the ai technologies that are happening Tough question. Who's going to be brave? I, I can I can say a word on that because the, last year was the indigenous in, uh, international international years of indigenous language at UNESCO, and there was a conference LT for all, and I was uh, glad to be to have um, to be there and to have a small uh, presentation. And uh, it's it's very important because if language technology is a commodity, it cannot be seen as a market. Uh, expansion opportunity for big players. So, and it is the case today. So, the first one that will be developing, I don't know which, which African language will be the one will will be able to sell its sell its, 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 its smartphone just because he has the keyboard that's the only keyboard that uh, support the, the language. And we should do exactly the reverse. We should give the opportunity uh, to the to the local players uh, to to develop their own technology based, of course, on what has been provided elsewhere. But because this will be a way for them to expand market, to build a market, and not just an, an, a market of uh, opportunity for for American players. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, anyone else got a view on that point? But don't you think this is a question for? Innovation again, you know. One of the one of the key things about um, I was reading the other day how um, in Africa um, they kind of they don't have an infrastructure of of network and cables, and that's why the the whole banking revolution in um, in Africa has taken place via mobile phones, and so that they have digital um, access to their accounts via mobile phones, and huge uptake of that so so i think innovation comes in different ways and this maybe innovation will actually solve the problem of getting uh m- new modern technology to shall we say underdeveloped areas that's a fantastic point with the the payment systems in in some countries mm-hmm. like continents um great and um hey let's take one last question um, what have you seen as important innovations by regional language service providers besides MT, of course? Um, Marcus Casal, is that one for you? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, language service providers, whether regional or global, you know, as, as Implexer is, it's, it's really a question about intimacy, right? With your customer, understanding their use case, understanding their needs. Um, increasingly, as we've been discussing, a lot of the tools are coming into us as utilities. So we're not building the tools, but the innovation then consists in assembly, in curating, assembling, combining those tools to, to meet the needs of the customer. And certainly the closer you are to the customer, um, the, the more intimate you are with the customer, uh, um, uh, the more you can you can deploy those in an innovative fashion on on their behalf. So the idea, I mean, look, there is consolidation in the language industry. You know, when Plexer uh, just recently merged uh, or is merging, I should say, verb tenses are very important here with with Accolade. Uh and and we all see, and of course, you know, the RWS SDL acquisition. So you know, consolidation is real, right? As it is in most industries, but as with most industries. There is always space for smaller players who have uh, a USP, who are closer to the customers, who understand uh, the specifics of um, of their needs. So you know, I think I think that's there, but I think you know they they do have to work harder to understand. Um, uh, what their customers needs and how to curate that whole set of technology, that toolbox that everyone increasingly has access to and apply it for, for each customer. Yeah, great great answer. Thank you very much for that, Mark. And look, um, let's, let's, start, let's wrap it up. You know, final thoughts. Uh, is there something you'd love to tell us but you really can't? <laughs> I have to ask the question. <laughs> Jean? Mm, not easy. <laughs> that could, that's a yes, uh, if I <laughs> understand uh, French, right? Um, Bob, anything you'd love to tell us, but you really can't? Well, I don't think in the time allowed, I'd, I'll be able to run through all the great points in XDM and uh, and what we have on our roadmap and innovative ideas we've got there. But uh, another time, perhaps, Dave. Fantastic. And, and Marcus and Marcus... <laughs> 
Yeah, I'd love to talk about a wonderful ecosystem and all the different companies we work with, but I'd get my knuckles wrapped. And I would love to talk about how Amplexer and Aqualad are coming together to create a European champion uh, in this space, but I can't quite do that yet. <laughs> you, you are knee deep in that at the moment, I believe. So thank you all for being uh, quite coy uh, and, and also for really being uh, insightful and um, uh, open with your, your views during this discussion. Uh, I'll just make a note to everyone who's still here. Uh, uh, Marcus Meisel just posted some information on design thinking, so I suggest you check those links, really interesting stuff. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to thank Jean, Marcus, uh, Marcus and Bob. Uh, thank you all for listening. We hope you got some valuable food for thought on innovation. And we wish you a great day and evening. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.